This is CBC Vancouver News. I believe that we may see the worst fire season on record. BC braces for a worsening wildfire season, a grim outlook province-wide paired with heat warnings for the lower mainland. Plus, we potentially have four months ahead of dry conditions uh, and we need to be really conscious about how we're using the really precious resource. Urgency around water conservation as parts of Vancouver Island are seeing drought conditions and summer has only just begun. Also, just their sheer size and weight means that they're they will eventually crowd out uh, the smaller painted turtles. Turtles taking over. What experts are doing to stave off an invasive species in BC lakes and ponds. Good evening, I'm Tanya Fletcher. We begin tonight with a worsening wildfire situation in BC. Tonight, a forest fire has grown dangerously close to a northern highway. The district of Fort St. James has put out a hazard notice. It warns the flames are nearing Highway 27, about two hours northwest of Prince George. It's yet another challenge to an already difficult and early wildfire season. Janella Hamilton looks ahead at what's on the horizon and what fire crews are preparing for. I believe that we may see the worst fire season on record. BC Wildfire Service says more than 1 million hectares of land has already been scorched by wildfires, and it's still early in the season. It now ranks as the third most hectares burned in any fire season in BC. Chapman says the bulk of fire activity has been in the northeast. There's been a lot of anxiety, uh, in particular in the north, and what we're going to see in the next few weeks is we're going to see more potential fire on the landscape spread from the north to the south with new starts with anticipated lightning each day. That looming lightning expected to hit much of the province. That could, that could possibly ignite new fires in the region and the warm and hot weather uh, will promote fire growth. Tuesday was the hottest day on record globally. Temperatures here in BC have been 5 to 10 degrees above normal. Experts say there's very little relief in sight until at least mid-August. We've seen those drought conditions that we've been speaking to you since the beginning of the season really persist and in fact deepen as we, we get into the core of our fire season here. The province's drought map blanketed in a sea of red. Uh, you'll recall a few weeks ago that we did expand our prohibitions in some fire centres to include campfires. We're going to be expanding our prohibitions again this Friday. Starting at noon on Friday, campfires will be banned across the Lower Mainland, Vancouver Island and in the interior to help combat human-caused fires, which is believed to be behind the Knox Mountain wildfire just north of Kelowna. <laughs> With increased wildfires on the horizon, firefighters from Mexico and the U.S. will be heading north to provide support. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, there are calls to beef up plans to prevent potential wildfires in Stanley Park, too. Yeah, Stanley mm -hmm. Park is a real jewel of ours. And, um, you know, in these hot days, it's drying out day by day. Uh, you know, week by week, it gets drier and drier. And um, we need to assess the forest fire risk there. Green Park Board Commissioner Tom Digby is calling for the Vancouver Park Board to update its plan to mitigate fire risk in BC's biggest urban park. The current Stanley Park Forest Management Plan has not been updated since 2009. The motion will be heard at Monday's board meeting. The increasingly hot weather has prompted Environment Canada to issue several heat warnings around the province. In Fraser Canyon South, including Lytton, daytime highs could climb to 35 degrees through Sunday. And Fort Nelson, along with the inland sections of the central coast, could hit 30 degrees this week. Health officials are encouraging people in those regions to drink plenty of water, never leave pets inside parked vehicles, and be sure to check on people vulnerable to heat-related illnesses. This hot, dry spell follows a spring that saw little rainfall across the province, and it's pushed many regions up to a four out of six on BC's drought scale. That includes eastern Vancouver Island, where Claire Palmer reports on the effort to preserve water levels. It was a busy day at the beach, more hot weather, and it's expected to continue as eastern Vancouver Island enters stage four drought. And we're moving into what's going to be a multi-year drought. So it isn't just that, you know, it's hot right now in, in you know, start of July. It's when we look at the preceding conditions, uh, it's setting us up at a lower flow level than, than normal for this time of year. 
There hasn't been much rain. Stream levels are low, leading the city of Nanaimo and the regional district to add tougher water restrictions. That means in certain areas, no more lawn sprinklers, no more washing vehicles in driveways, and residents can't fill swimming pools or garden features. I have a pretty nice house that I'm taking care of, and uh, the, we will lose things if we have to um, stay on those restrictions for a long time period. You know, just for the future of our grandkids and their kids and upcoming generations, we have to like really get a grip on what's going on and how to fix it and how to be more proactive. And that drought has also led to a challenging wildfire season on the island. And I think we've really seen that in recent fires, be it the Cameron Bluff fire or uh, a new fire that broke out near Nitnat Lake uh, over the weekend here. We're, we're observing, you know, aggressive fire behavior that reflects uh, these deeper underlying drought conditions. The district is reminding residents that the steps they take now make a huge impact later in the summer season. It's a marathon and not a sprint to the end of the low flow season. We potentially have four months ahead of dry conditions uh, and we need to be really conscious about how we're using the really precious resource of water. Right now, much of the province is listed at drought level four, including northeastern BC, the lower mainland and the upper Fraser basins. Claire Palmer, CBC News, Nanaimo. On to day five of BC's port strike and negotiations remain at an impasse. It all boils down to a disagreement over a maintenance deal. The union says its jurisdiction over maintenance is being eroded and replaced by contractors. The group representing the employer, meanwhile, is now proposing binding arbitration to end the strike. And despite growing calls for back to work legislation, Ottawa insists it's up to the two sides to reach a resolution. Our government strongly believes that the best uh, negotiations take place at the table and we encourage all parties to uh, go to the table and, and to find ways to get to a resolution and we'll continue of course to collaborate to enable that, uh, that possibility of getting to a resolution at the table. Meanwhile, dispute resolution experts say they're not surprised the federal government is staying arm's length for now. I think the government would be looking at it and saying, I'm not sure that the parties have exhausted all of the avenues. I'm not sure they've looked at, for example, the, the contracting out issue for maintenance and said, how can we deal with that? Are there compromises that can be reached? Can we come up with a solution that works for everybody? And I think the government and probably everyone agrees that if the parties can reach their own solution, that's better than having back to work legislation and having a solution imposed on them. More than 7,000 workers at 30 ports across the province have been on strike since Saturday morning. The province is expanding its program to better connect British Columbians with family doctors. The Health Connect registry will make it easier for patients to connect with family doctors who have the capacity and ability to take on new patients. A strong long-term family doctor and patient relationship is necessary for the best health outcomes. The improvements include a new compensation model intended to retain family doctors, as well as coordinators to connect doctors and nurses with patients and health registries to keep track of clinics accepting new patients. In other news now, after a two-week delay, the Ibrahim Ali trial resumed this morning. He's the man charged with the first-degree murder of a Burnaby teen in 2017. Crown prosecutors spent much of the day focusing on Ali's cell phone, including an hour-long video of the phone sitting on a table at an RCMP station shortly after the arrest. Prosecutors say the purpose of the footage was to show the phone was not interfered or tampered with. The Crown has said phone records will show that Ali was in Burnaby the day of the murder. The man who pleaded guilty to a deadly attack in North Vancouver in 2021 is now being sentenced. Crown and Defence have made a joint recommendation of life in prison with no chance of parole for at least 15 years. Two years ago, 28-year-old Yannick Bandwago was, uh, went on a stabbing spree in Lynn Valley. People hid inside local businesses and the library as he attacked multiple people. A woman in her 20s was killed. He has pleaded guilty to one count of second-degree murder, five counts of attempted murder, and one count of aggravated assault. Today, court heard from victims and their family members about the lasting impact of the stabbings. Some sad news out of merit this afternoon. Councillor Claire Newman has died in what's believed to be a hit-and-run. The city says the crash happened outside Vale Mount. Merritt Mayor Mike Getz is pleading with the driver who hit Newman to come forward. The city is accepting flowers at City Hall on her behalf and has lowered its flag to half-mast. 
BC's monthly housing stats were showing little relief for those worried about affordability. The average selling price of a detached home in Greater Vancouver decreased very slightly to $2.1 million. That's still far above pre-pandemic levels. In the Fraser Valley, the selling price for townhomes is up for a sixth straight month, going for around hundred grand more than at the start of the year. Earlier today, our Justin McElroy spoke with a local economist and they took audience questions. Take a listen. We got a question in from T that's pretty to the point. He says, so just wait for my parents' uh, house or to, to, for them to die. And like lots of people, if you're not in the market and if you don't have that source of income, that is pretty much the strategy right now for better or worse. So like, what do you say to people who go, you know what, for the past seven, eight years, it's been completely out of my place to even think about saving up for it. And what I'm hearing from you and what I'm hearing from policymakers doesn't give me any optimism that it's going to turn around. No, I actually don't really think it's going to turn around. And, and as that question is, there is a, a significant number who are likely waiting on um, wealth and and um, and uh, gains coming from um, uh, intergenerational uh, types of transfers. Um, so really, that is one of the ways in which individuals are likely get into this market. Um, and when we think about the, you know, how do we build more for younger individuals, uh, unfortunately, or I, I think what we're going to see here is that there will be some move, uh, and unfortunately, there will be move to build more rentals in the in the market. Um, but this is going to be much more of a renter type of, of a market as well going forward. We will expect to see uh, a greater share of, uh, of Metro Vancouver being a renter's market uh, versus a home ownership market over the, over the long haul. But but if it's a renter's market and it's still twenty five hundred bucks for a one bedroom, what sort of person can afford that? Um, I think. And I know you're who, not prime minister or premier, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it's very difficult. I don't think uh, there's a there's a clear answer of how do we um, ensure that we get more rental, except to again getting policymakers to push for the build more type of mentality um, and really densify in terms of in a lot of different areas to allow greater density, allowing cost per, per square foot uh, of a rental and also a multifamily condos um, to hopefully, again, to level that, uh, that affordability issue over time. Um, and so again, if we can build more, I do think that we are looking at a period where we could see some a moderation and possibly over the long haul, maybe some uh, reduction in price per square foot over time. Uh, but again, there is a lot of uh, those uh, ifs uh, of, of what the policymakers can do, and also how do we reduce the cost of building as well in order to facilitate that. All right, Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time, even if uh, your expertise on this may not make exactly everyone optimistic about the future, but uh, uh, that's where we are at in this neck of the woods these days. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Well, BC's largest indoor bike park is now open for cyclists of all skill levels. As we're experiencing here in British Columbia in the summer times, between heat domes and you know and uh, the wildfires and so forth, uh, there's all kinds of reasons or benefits to being able to enjoy bike or cycling in an indoor environment. The bike park is inside Capilano Mall. It's funded by a group of North Shore residents who aim to combine a love of cycling with their hope of repurposing unused retail space. Spanning 65,000 feet, the North Shore Bike Park offers all kinds of tracks, ramps and jump lines. I'm more of an advanced rider. There's just so many options and transfers you can do on all the jumps. And then there's so much that you can improve on. The park will be open seven days a week and other locations across North America are now in the works as well. Well, two dogs have joined Vancouver Coastal Health's Canines for Care team to detect harmful bacteria in hospitals. Archie and Anton went through thousands of hours of scent detection training to prepare them for their big role. They're able to reduce infection by sniffing out a bacteria called C. difficile. They search three to four units a day and if they find the bacteria, a cleaning crew finishes the job. C. diff is a significant environment because it's a superbug, so it's really hard to kill. It's resistant to many drugs. Uh, it affects people that are already autoimmune compromised. Two 11-week-old puppies have also joined the team. They'll be in training for the next year. It's a podcast three decades in the making. After the break, how one British Columbian is using the platform to process past trauma 
and reclaim her own story. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. An invasive species of turtle is taking over some of BC's lakes and ponds. As a vet brand shows us, discarded pets are posing a big threat to some already endangered native turtles. Biologist Amy Mitchell is on the hunt for turtles. They crowd logs to soak up the sun, but most aren't from around here. That, that log is dominated uh, mostly by sliders, red eared sliders over there. Um, but there is one turtle that I'm pretty sure is a painted um, right beside the biggest slider and you can really see the size difference. Non-native red-eared sliders are reproducing here. They grow fast despite being used to warmer waters like the Mississippi. She says they muscle out endangered western painted turtles. So with turtles uh, the rule is that the, the biggest turtle wins. So um, just their sheer size and weight means that they're they will eventually crowd out uh, the smaller painted turtles. Sliders are the world's most popular pet turtle. They're, they're present in a lot of wetlands, in urban wetlands, because people put them there. He says the diseases pet turtles can carry are a bigger problem than shared basking spots. Native painted turtles already face the threat of wetland lost, car hits and fishing hooks, not to mention predators that dig up their nests. Conservationists want to help native turtles in their slow, steady race to survive. So yeah, they usually dig down like at least uh, a foot, 30 centimeters. Females can bury up to two dozen eggs. No eggs today, like most things with turtles. It's a waiting game. Females take years to mature. I just saw its little head poking out from some of the aquatic veg. It was just kind of hanging on, hanging out on the surface. Um, so I just snagged her, snagged her with my net. What went through your gut when you saw that little? Uh, yeah, I was just so excited. After years of waiting, catching and counting even one little hatchling before letting it go again, brings a lot of hope. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Coquitlam. Welcome back. A young woman abducted from a store on Vancouver's Hastings Street 31 years ago today is finally sharing her story. Lenore Rattray fought for years to keep the details of her, her ordeal private, but now she's finding healing through taking control of her story and releasing a podcast about it. Rattray sat down with our Jennifer Wilson for her first media interview in decades. And a warning to listeners, the story contains discussion of sexual assault that some might find distressing. My name is Lenore Rattray. I um, have lived with the impact of this crime that I survived. I'm not going to lie, it's a pretty, pretty vulnerable place to be. You only see this stuff in movies, and you, you just can't imagine there are sick, disgusting, just... In 1992, I think I moved here at the end of April, so fast forward July, early July, I quickly found a job just working as um, a an assistant in a photo studio. I was working by myself. I see now how he stalked me. Um, he saw the opportunity, he saw 
all of the things that he was looking for, a young woman working alone. He'd asked all the right questions. He'd been in the studio a couple of times that uh, this one day. And um, he came back at closing time and pulled a gun and uh, eventually took me to the woods, kept me there for close to nine days. I had no idea if I was going to live to see real life again. I wasn't a match for him and fought, you know, I did fight him, but the way that I handled him in more of a, of a conversational sense and um, that kind of thing is what kept me alive. Him messing up, he was doing the same thing. He would leave me for a portion of the day of like, I don't even know how long it was, 20 minutes or so and go across the road uh, to Safeway and then the other stores there and, and pick up stuff. And I discovered after the fact that he was actually continuing his pattern of looking for young females working by themselves. And he did find another young lady working by herself July 11th, he took her and um, forced her to drive her car to where we were camped and for some reason brought me with them. I remember her looking at me and just the fear in her eyes was, and I was just numb to it all. And eventually we were separated. I could hear him beating her and her trying to get away. I could hear them in another part. And then the next thing I know, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, the police are at the car. I'm on my way now. I'm not going to hurt you anymore. And I looked and he just, he almost like melted into the bush. Why now would I want to open up details about really what happened in those nine days. It's empowering for me for the first time. We always look at true crime, often I'd say, look at true crime through the lens of the criminal, the perpetrator having this superhuman element about him. Usually it's a him. So me telling this story now about what about the superhuman? that survived this and continues to 30 years later and raise a family and have a job and, and, you know, and her network, her mom and her dad, this lives with them forever. By setting this story free, finally, now that I'm ready, it's, I feel growth whenever I do. There they go. It's Wednesday night at Exhibition Park. And it is win a dream and along the inside, extra formal, extra formal. No. The crowd has it's never been Let's this big. More than 16,000 people are here. That's twice the normal turnout for a Wednesday, and the main attraction is the Sweep Six. It's the racetrack's latest feature. What you have to do is pick the winner in six consecutive races, the fourth through ninth. It costs $2 to make a bet, and if no one wins one night, the money goes into the pool for the following race day. And the reason everyone's here is the amount you can win for your measly $2. Last night, the pool stood at more than $992,000. Your attention, everyone, with five races remaining in the Sweep 6 Series, there are 52,594 live bets remaining. 52,594. The number of so-called live tickets drops very fast. With three sweep six races left, there were just over 2,000 live tickets. Bobby held one of them. Well, out here I always expect the worst because I've had horses, good horses, like big odds win before, 
and you get disqualified. Like that guy that lost on Monday night in the disqualification, I know how he feels because that's happened to me lots. With race four over, there were only 163 live tickets, and Bobby was still in there. Well, it's starting to get a little nervous now. Uh, I got a shot, but like I've only got two horses in the next two races, so you never know. By the end of race five, there was only one live ticket left, and Bobby was out of the picture. Disappointed? Yeah. Well, especially, you know, like you, I'd sooner my horses run dead last than run second, you know. My horse runs second, I get beat by a horse that gets beat 25 lengths by the same horse as last time right. they run, you know. The thing looks like no way, but I mean, that's the way it goes in horse racing. So going into the sixth race, there was only one live ticket. Unfortunately for the holder, it didn't win. And somewhere out there is a frustrated gambler who came inches from winning a million. But as they say, close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and marriage. Anyway, it just means there will be even more excitement at the track on Friday, when the sweep six pool will likely reach $1.7 million. Here comes Pertuck charging into the lead now as they come to the wire. The gambling hordes are sure to be there. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. The 15th annual Latin Coover Festival continues to July 20th, and CBC Vancouver is proud to be the exclusive media partner. Enjoy a series of sensational Latin American experiences and the popular Carnaval del Sol Festival. And the Herb Original is a new CBC British Columbia podcast. Stream it today on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace. Installing the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Meteorologist Russ LeCate joins us now with a look at the long range forecast. And Russ, we really felt that heat settle in today. How, yeah. how long do we think it's going to last? Turned up a bit, uh, absolutely. We have one more day's worth of it, Tanya. Just one with some changes on the way before we get to the weekend. It's funny, I walked in here earlier today all prepared to do the satellite analysis, thinking it's all about high pressure, great big ridge across the province again. Something a little different, though. There were some thin spots, some weaker areas in that ridge, and we saw little areas of moisture sort of tracking on through. And with the heat of the midday sun, of course, all the rising air columns blossomed and set off a number of thunderstorms into parts of the northeast, and that may be redeveloping at times for tomorrow. How hot was it today? Well, we had some daytime highs to 34 degrees in Port Alberni. All along the east coast of Vancouver Island, it was in the low 30s. I think it gets there again tomorrow, but that should be the final day of heat. Central interior, mid to upper 20s, parts of the Caribou similar, Kamloops to 32 degrees, the Okanagan tomorrow in the low 30s. But a chance of any thunderstorms around there, but I think it is slim to none. Your forecast across much of the province does include isolated thunderstorms leaking down from parts of Fort Nelson to Fort St. John, Dawson Creek, maybe showing up in Prince George as well, and then grazing along along sections of the eastern Columbia's eastern Kootenays. We might see a late day thunderstorm in Cranbrook at 29 degrees. Okanagan in the low 30s, Victoria 28. Again, that is inland areas by the water's edge. It's always more comfortable around Victoria Harbour. And how hot was it here today? We had 32 degrees in Pitt Meadows. Coastal with that light sea breeze at 24. Your numbers are similar tomorrow, but it's the last day when we'll turn the heat up. Aiming for a high of 30 degrees inland tomorrow, 26 on the beaches. By Friday, I think that spread across the lower mainland is so insignificant, might be one or two degrees. We'll just put the number in the middle at 24. Lots of cloud Friday morning, clearing by the end of the day. A lovely weekend, comfortable, and lots of sunshine to go around. Not a bad forecast at all. Thank you very much, You're Russ. welcome.
And that is your late news for this Wednesday. For news at any hour, of course, you can always check out our website. We're at cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 5.30. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good night.